I'm going to start off with emergency radiology because I think the plain film actually follows quite nicely from emergency radiology because uh, it's, it's only in emergency radiology that you're using plain films and that also a minuscule amount as much as I would say. Um, as far as emergencies are concerned in radiology, we're getting busier and busier and uh, what used to be one scan in on a Sunday for us 15 years ago when I joined as a consultant here, uh, we're now doing about 50 scans. So uh, nobody has felt the brunt of increasing volumes of work as much as radiology has. So be sympathetic to your radiology colleagues. Um, but it's important for both uh, ENT surgeons and radiologists to make appropriate use of radiology um, when, it is, uh, when it is required. So for each of the type of emergencies that you account, uh, encounter, we'll ask the same questions. Um, uh, what, uh, when should you ask for an imaging investigation? What type of scan or x-ray should you ask for? And uh, why would you scan and how does it help you? So let's go through your emergencies. Um, ENT emergency is of three main types. One is detection of foreign bodies around infection and trauma, which you all will know more than I do. Uh, when we look at foreign bodies, we are no use to you when it comes to foreign body of the year or nose because you deal with them without radiology. We do come in use when, we to, uh, when there are throat foreign bodies or in the bronchus, uh, foreign bodies in the bronchus. So um, when there is a suspicion of a foreign body in the throat, uh, you would do a lateral soft tissue x-ray of the neck to confirm and locate the position of the foreign body. So here is uh, uh, some, the normal pre-vertebral tissues um, that it's less than two millimeters and that's what you normally see on a lateral view of the neck. And here you can cl clearly see the coin foreign body. So AP and lateral, this is in the upper esophagus. And this is uh, the pre-vertebral soft tissue, which should be two millimeters now expanded. It's more than a centimeter. So uh, this is due to a retropharyngeal abscess from a non-radiopaque um, non foreign body. So, uh, and we, we can also use water-soluble contrast to assess for, uh, for non-radiopaque foreign body. But having said this, I think increasingly what we're doing is we're using CT scan. CT is kind of, it's just the spiraled, the use of CT for emergency um, radiology for everyone really, whether it be brain, neck, chest, abdo, pelvis, and even peripheral angiograms, which used to be done as an interventional procedure, now is being done with CT. So we're doing CTs let, literally every 10 minutes uh, for e emergency work, and we're doing it at night as well. Um, but that is the, the, the uh, you know, it, it's, the, uh, it's a result of the success in which how imaging is helping clinical management of the, uh, the, uh, the patients. So we are victims of our own success, really. Um, so here is a foreign body in the esophagus, and you can see you can see it so much better. You can localize it clearly where it is, uh, what structures there is, and if it has perforated through the esophagus, you'd be able to see the mediastinal layer. So the amount of information you actually get from a CT is far superior to what a, a, a barium, uh, a, a water-soluble swallow would do. So that we're not. Do, I've, I don't know when I last did a water-soluble swallow over a weekend when I'm been on call. Uh, strider, uh, if you when when a patient presents with strider and there's a suspicion of foreign body, you would do a plain X-ray of the neck to confirm and locate the foreign body. Uh, so here is a foreign body uh, with the widening of the pre-vertebral soft tissues, as you can see there. Um, but remember that plain X-ray is only 40% sensitive. So uh, again. Uh, CT becomes a much more sensitive test for uh, location of foreign body and detection of foreign bodies. Uh, when a patient presents with suspicion of foreign body in the bronchus, you would do a plain x-ray of the chest to confirm and uh, locate the position. So this is a dental amalgam that has gone into the right main bronchus. Um, again, um, when we uh, look at, sorry, going back, so that again, CT is getting far better with multiplanar reconstructions. Every CT you can do an MPR and it gives you from axial planes to coronal and sagittal planes. And that is very helpful for surgeons who want to actually 
pre-plan their operations. And you'll see that happening in, in uh, multiple areas of uh, clinical practice. So when, let us move from foreign bodies to infections. When you have a patient with acute mastoiditis and presents with headache, drowsiness, or focal neurology, uh, what you're trying to do is exclude. At the back of your mind, you're t tell, asking yourself, because you can treat mastoiditis. That's not, um, that's not difficult for you. You know what a mastoid, you know, you've got discharging here, and that, you, you're quite familiar with that. What you don't know is, has it uh, breached a tegmen te tempani? Has it gone into the brain? Is there a brain abscess develop, developing? Do we need to get the neurosurgeons involved? So that is the question you're asking. And that is important that you ask the right question to get the right examination. Because what you need is a, a CT brain with contrast because we need to see the brain tissue. Here is a posterior uh, fossa abscess from a mastoiditis and then a basal abscess as well. So you need to ask the right question of the radiologist so they know what they're doing. And there you can see the clouding of the, uh, of the mastoid uh, with the cerebral abscess. Sorry. And you can see on that image the edema in the posterior fossa in the cerebellar around the cerebellar lobe. So that, that you need to know, and the patient is developing hydrocephalus because the fourth ventricle has been uh, pushed and narrowed so you can see the lateral horn. So th th at the back of your mind, if the patient is getting headache, drowsiness, you need to be thinking laterally. That's what doctors are supposed to do. You know, they think what is, what is possible, what are the complications, and how do we image and manage them. So going on to the next area, which is the tonsillitis, and antibiotics have failed, and you're, you're considering that uh, it might uh, need, the neck abscess is developing, which needs drainage. CT with contrast, again, uh, the more we look at emergency work, you're finding the word CT being used. So in emergency, CT is a very good tool. So you're looking for, uh, to find the location and extent of the neck abscess for surgical planning because you're going to decide how to approach the neck based on what we find on CT. So here is um, a neck abscess, which is uh, developing in the prevertebral fascia. And that will help your surgical approach. You will, uh, you will go in and you will, uh, it, you will remember to go in the prevertebral fascia area to make sure you clear all the areas that the abscess is. So you don't do just a local, uh, uh, local drainage, you actually go in. And, but one word of warning, uh, I've, I've heard many a times, and I tell this to my, uh, because we, you can't have an ENT radiologist on each of your, uh, uh, your uh, on-call days. So the general radiologist, anyone who's a diagnostic radiologist, we run a, a one in 11 um, uh, rotor, which has got, uh, which is basically a shift pattern that we work. Although we are consultants, we run an emergency shift because of the volume of work. So I do tell the radiologist to remind ENT surgeons that uh, just because we can't, we don't see a discrete abscess, it doesn't mean that uh, there isn't an abscess because an inflammatory phlegmon with high dense uh, density pus tissue can look like soft tissue. Uh, from the density because we are working on density. Whereas here, because it's liquefied, so it looks different. But if it was if it was very dense pus, it would look exactly like the muscles out there. So it's, we are basing on density, but always have at the back of your mind, if you feel fluctuation, it's an indication to drain. Don't just rely that we can't see a discrete abscess. I do remind the radiologist to say um, just a, 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 an absence cannot be entirely excluded with CT. Please use your clinical judgment as well. So here is a horseshoe abscess that has uh, developed um, uh, surrounding the thyroid cartilage from acute tonsillitis. So that's, that's the abscess there and that's the tonsillitis there. And also another uh, reminder about uh, here ultrasound has been used and uh, somebody who's good at doing neck ultrasounds and understands the anatomy will pick that up. But believe you me, it's very, very difficult uh, neck ultrasound. Uh, it, it, if done in right hands, it, it is good. But I'm more and more keen that people rely on CT and encourage your radiology teams to provide you with the CT out of hours because that, that is, the, is the right test to do. But 
knowing as ENT surgeons that it is not 100% accurate. It is a judgment call, and that's what the doctors get paid the high salaries for, is to make good judgments for patients because medicine is not maths. Um, the limitations, as I said, um, uh, is that with ultrasound as well, when you have, um, we, again, we are, uh, we are basing on reflectivity, reflectivity of tissue. So if you have thick pus, it can look very dense and look like soft tissue on, on ultrasound as well. So th therefore, you might miss an abscess. So if you think you have fluctuation or clinical signs or you're worried about the patient and it, you know, make that judgment call and consider uh, uh, drainage of the patient. Don't let them, um, uh, you know, don't take your hands off the patient saying the radiology is negative, therefore I will, I will not do anything. Um, a few surgeons have been bitten by that. So patients have developed neck abscess from lymphadenitis and antibiotics fail to work and neck abscess is developing, which needs drainage. CT with contrast uh, helps you to find the location and the extent of the neck abscess and helps with surgical planning. So this is a patient who presented with neck abscess and CT identified the, what, uh, this is quite an interesting case. I think it was um, a prisoner and we uh, detected the, um, the vertebral body osteomyelitis, that vertebral body is gone and, uh, sorry, there, and that vertebral body is gone. And it, I think, was a cold abscess, uh, tubercular abscess. Um, and there was an MRI scan I had a similar case with. So um, CT and MRI imaging do, does help you. When, uh, in fact, the MRI was on a prisoner who had come for, um, uh, for a neck, uh, a neck MRI because there was a lump in the neck and we found the vertebral body involved, and it was TB osteomyelitis. So it wasn't an emergency situation. Um, head injury, when a patient presents with head injury and has a seventh nerve palsy, uh, you should request a temporal bone CT to diagnose a te temporal bone fracture. So this is a horizontal fracture of the temporal bone that you can see there. So uh, you, you're looking at involvement uh, of the whether it was the seventh cranial nerve, which you can see very well on mastoid imaging. And also here you've got the, vertib uh, the vertical fracture and it's involving the vestibular system. Um, uh, we are doing much more thinner slice CTs and provided the skull base is, is imaged uh, with, the, with the CT, uh, we can see the temporal bone quite well. But if you're, if you're suspecting skull base fracture, put it on the request card, make sure the skull base is included with the brain, and we can do the bony reconstructions on that CT because that's done as part of fracture protocol anyway. So let's move on to sinusitis. Uh, when a patient presents with complication of sinusitis and there's concerns of a, of a periorbital abscess, CT scan with contrast is, uh, is required for surgical planning. So you're looking for, is there an abscess uh, and is there a periorbital abscess and how, how can we get in? So here is the periorbital abscess. Here's your sinusitis uh, in the ethmoid sinuses. And uh, this, is, this will help you surgically plan the patient. Um, with trauma um, of, the, of the face and mandible is suspected, uh, you would do a plain x-ray to, to confirm the presence of fracture. Um, but nowadays, uh, maxillofacial surgeons are increasingly doing CT for surgical planning too. It's, it's quite common to do CTs straight in A&E. Um, as I said, we're doing a lot more. So while radiology is useful for assessment of uh, fracture of face and mandible, um, it is of little use for fracture of the nose, as you know, and I hope none of your departments are doing uh, x-rays for fracture of the nose because we don't do it. Uh, fracture of the zygomatic arch, as you can see here, um, and plain x-ray is quite good. Um, there is fracture of the mandible on both sides. Um, uh, as you can see there, it's not very clear on these. Uh, and then this fracture of the neck of the mandible on the left side. Um, so a good, good for plain x-rays is good for fracture detection. And again, we're using more of CTs uh, for facial bone 
imaging for fractures and uh, max facts also like these 3D recons uh, for surgical planning purposes. So we're doing more and more of that. Um, when you suspect laryngeal or tracheal in, in injury, you should request a CT for uh, deciding how to manage the patient. Um, and here you can easily diagnose fractures of the thyroid, uh, arytenoid, cricoid cartilage, and also assess the airway. So these are fractures that you can see. Um, it, it's, it's pretty good for uh, fractures uh, uh, for the, uh, your uh, laryngeal skeleton. When you suspect vascular injury to the neck, you should request a CT angiograph angiography to decide management plans. Um, again, CT angiography, I said, as I said, we're doing everything with CT these days. So here you can see um, there is a dissection of the internal carotid artery there. So that's a CT angiography. It's just a, a different phase. Uh, it's all CTs, but it's a different phase uh, of contrast when we start the imaging. So in summary, um, radiology can help ENT emergencies with foreign body detection, infection, and trauma, as we discussed. And in summary, plain films are used for screening of foreign body and of bronchus and uh, of throat and bronchus and fractures of face and mandible. Uh, if in doubt, always proceed to a non-contrast CT for uh, foreign body and fracture diagnosis and for the diagnosis of brain and periorbital or neck abscesses, uh, you should request a contrast CT because the contrast is enhancement around the infection to localize an abscess collection if we can see one. So, so I'm going to move on to the next presentation, which is um, a role of